Let's go over to Psalm 30. The Lord must want me to say something out of Psalm 30, right? Right? I mean, why would I say it? I mean, I think the Lord is just looking down from heaven, laughing, saying, what a, what a, what a crazy guy is behind that pulpit. All right, Psalm 30, verse 1, and then we'll go to Proverbs 30. Come on, bear with me. It's okay. We have time. Psalm 30, verse 1. I will extol thee. Do you know what the word extol means? Praise and lift up. That's what that word means. Lift up and praise. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Amen. What a blessing. Now let's go over to Proverbs 30. <clears throat> Proverbs 30. Kathy thinks I'm nuts and that's all right. That's fine. You all know that too, right? That's what makes life interesting here at Seneca Bible Baptist Church. Not boring around here. All right. Proverbs. Proverbs 30. We're talking about four little things. Verse 24, Proverbs 30, 24. I'll read this. You just follow along as I read. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Uh, the conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Father, bless the message uh, as we started it this morning. Please, Lord, just be with us tonight and help us to see some things about these other little creatures that you made. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, four little things that are exceeding wise. Now, if they are exceeding wise, we should be able to learn some lessons from these Four little creatures. We have the ants. I spent the whole morning this morning just talking uh, about the ants. One thing I didn't say that, that I think that we need to think about is we are, I think we're living in a summer of grace where souls need to be saved. And we ought to be concentrating on lost people, getting them saved while we can do that. The ants, they work when it's time to work. We talked about that this morning. But also, there's a gathering time for salvation that we need to be concerned about. Uh, we need to th constantly be thinking about how can we help a lost soul get saved? Is there anything that we can do? Yes. There's gospel tracts, there's invitations, there's testimonies, there's witnessing, there's invitations to church, there's all kinds of things that we as Christians can do. Are we doing it? There is a summer grace period that God has given to us. One of these days, it's going to be over. And we're going to be gone. Every Christian is leaving this planet one of these days soon. Every Christian. There will not be one born-again Christian uh, at, after the moment after the rapture. Now, there'll be some people getting saved during the tribulation period. I believe that. We see that in the book of Revelation. But right after the rapture, there won't be a Christian anywhere to be found on planet Earth. That's sobering to think about that. And this country is going to take a nosedive uh, into wickedness and evil. Um, we need to be doing what we need to be doing now. Um, Deborah's been going out on Saturday mornings and knocking on doors. She needs a lady to go with her Saturday mornings. If you're a lady, and not if you're a lady, you're a lady, and you want to you wanna go on visitation um, with Deborah, please talk to her. You see her, okay? Yesterday she went out. She didn't have anybody to go with, but she went out on her own putting door hangers on doors in a certain area of Seneca Falls. But we need to be doing things like that getting the gospel message out. So if you want to help her do that on Saturday mornings, I, it was 10 o'clock you go or something? 9.30 here. 9.30 here. Meet 9.30 here. Yeah, yeah. And more than one can go. You guys could take both sides of streets and, you know, one couple go on one side of the street, another couple can go down on another side of the street. She would love to take any lady, teenage girl. Um, Michelle went with her one week. That was a huge blessing that Michelle was, was out doing that. Um, 
Again, there's this gathering time of salvation that we need to be concerned about. That's why we need to be involved in county fairs, parades, anything we can do to get people saved. Let's take a look at the next little guy or little creature, and uh, that is the coney. Um, the conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. So if you wrote down with the ant this morning as we looked at it, we, we said that we need to, uh, I have four things here that we are going to look at. Um, the first one there was what? The ants represent preparation. Preparation. So here's the next one. The, the conies represent protection. Protection. Write that word down. Protection. That's they, they look for the proper kind of shelter to be in. Now, what is a coney other than, other than what Hoffman hot dogs are? We, we like the white hot, hot dogs that you get from Hoffman's. They're called conies or coonies. We call them that. And um, they are good. We like them. That is not what a coney is. A co the word or the name coney means hider, something that hides itself. Now, it's about the size and color of a rabbit. Now, a lot of people that I have read studying this out say that the coney is an old name for a rabbit. However, a coney is a coney, and a rabbit is a rabbit. They resemble one another, but a coney is not a rabbit, and a rabbit is not a coney. Even though they resemble one another in size and even in color, uh, a coney doesn't have a tail. A rabbit has a little tail, right? Yeah. You rabbit lovers here, you rabbit, you rabbit, what do you call those? You, you rabbit people that talk to rabbits and, and like rabbits and all that. But uh, a coney doesn't have a tail. Its feet are not formed for digging, so they cannot dig a burrow and live. Rabbits dig, right? Yeah. They have a way to dig, and they, they, they burrow into the, into the dirt, into the ground, and they usually have an exit somewhere. They go in one hole and out the other. That's what a rabbit does. A, a coney can't do that. They don't have, God didn't give them feet that will, will dig. They don't have that feet for digging. So uh, they have to find their home in the rocks and in the clefts of the rocks. Um, and again, they, they resemble a rabbit, but they're not really a rabbit. Uh, I know a lot of, as I saw, um, you know, little side notes in a Bible, people would write down rabbit, and, uh, but they're really not a rabbit. They're similar, but not a rabbit. Their houses, the Bible says in that verse, it says, The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. So they find a place in a rock, in a, a bunch of rocks, whatever, hillside, and that's where they make their homes because it's a safe place to go. It's the best place to put their protection in, is in the rocks. Now, when you think about that and we study our Bible, we know that Jesus Christ is called the rock. So that's what we're going to think about or look, about, uh, look at here tonight is how Christ is our protection. Just as the coney has his or her protection in the rocks, that's where we put our protection in. Uh, go over to Deuteronomy chapter 32, Deuteronomy 32, and I just have a few verses on this, but you'll see. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. I'm going to start reading in verse 1, down to verse 4. Deuteronomy 32, verse 1. This is called the Song of Moses, this passage of Scripture. 32, Deuteronomy, verse 1. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Look at what it says in verse 4, He is the rock. My Bible has a capital R there for rock. Does yours? Okay, that's good. That's a name for God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, 
a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Christ is, or God is, our rock. So as the coney burrows, not burrows, but goes and finds a place in the rocks for his or her home, so we as Christians, we put our trust and faith and protection into Jesus Christ. He is our shelter. He is the one that we go to. We trust Him as Lord and Savior, and then we follow Him in our lives and in His Word, and so He is our rock. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Again, these little creatures that God created and mentioned here in Proverbs 30, we can learn some neat things from these little individuals because they are exceeding wise. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. So Hannah, Samuel's mother, realized that God was her rock. 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel 22. This is the parallel passage of Psalm 18, when David was rescued from the hand of Saul. 2 Samuel chapter 22. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my, say it, rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. And so again, we see that Uh, When we see the word rock in many places throughout the Bible, it represents God Almighty. Um, Psalm, just the parallel passage of what I just read, let's take a look at Psalm, verse 18. It's worth repeating. Psalm 18. I was going to say Psalm 30, but no, I'm just joking. (laughs) Psalm, Psalm 18. Verse two, uh, verses 1 and 2. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Psalm 92, verse 15. To show that the Lord is upright, He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. He is my rock. Is He your rock tonight? If you're saved, He's your rock. He's your protection. Go over to New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Paul writes about this, and he actually completely identifies who the rock, who the rock is. He's not that movie star that everybody likes, the big strong guy, whoever, he, I forget his name, Dwayne somebody, Dwayne Yeah. I had a knock knock joke I was going to tell you. Yeah, how's it doing? Knock knock. Dwayne. Dwayne, the bathtub, I'm drowning. (laughs) I, I know. It's bad, I know. There's a whole bunch of those. Knock, knock. We, won't, we won't get into that. Those aren't, they're not spiritual. 
All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? And they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them, and that rock was who? Christ. That rock was Christ. So the Bible gives us and identifies exactly who the rock is. What better place to put your protection uh, and your shelter than in Jesus Christ? He's your Lord. He's your Savior. Go to Matthew 16. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our protector. He is everything for us. Matthew chapter 16. One more verse on this and we'll move to the locusts. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to look at verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. This is the Lord talking, right? And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, some religions, primarily one that I am thinking of, takes that verse and quickly reads through it and says, Ah, Peter is the rock that we need to build the church on. And they believe that Peter was the first pope. So that ought to give you a little clue as to what I'm talking about. But that is not what the Lord was saying. A study of the words and the name of Peter in this verse clearly makes it uh, understandable as to exactly what the Lord was saying. Doug, Doug, can I use you for, for a minute? Yes, yes. Poor Doug. All right. You ready? I'm, I'm ready. Okay. All right. Now, this is what... <laughs> Calm down. Okay. Okay. All right. We weren't there when the Lord said this, okay? So we don't know what, how the Lord said it to Peter, but this is what I vision, envision uh, when, I, when I read this. Because based, we're going to tell you what these names mean here in a minute. But it's almost like when Jesus actually said that, He said... Um, thou art Peter, all right, pointing to Peter, possibly pointing to Peter, right? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Thou art Peter, but upon this rock. Now, again, we weren't there. We don't know the hand motions. We don't know if the Lord did that or not. But when you read the definitions of the name, when you look up what Peter means and what rock here is, uh, how it was translated, it's very obvious that thou art Peter. This is who you are. Upon this rock, Christ. Christ was saying, upon this rock, I will build my church. Thank you. You can. That was easy, wasn't it? Yeah. Simple. Not complicated. So when you take a look at the word or the name Peter, it comes from the Greek word Petros. P-E-T-R-O-S. Petros with the accent on P-E-T, Petros. That is the name for Peter, okay? And the definition of Petros is a small piece of a rock, a small rock. Um, not a tiny pebble, but a, but a, a piece of a rock, okay? That's the, that's the actual definition of it. And then when the Lord said, upon this rock, that's a, different, that's a whole different name. That is Petra. No Petros, but Petra. Upon this rock, the word Petra means a massive rock, a huge rock, much bigger than what Peter was representing. Okay, so thou art Peter, just a little rock, upon this rock, Petra, Petra, a massive rock, will I build my church. So do you see the difference? There is just a, a definition there that you need to see that. And if you don't look that up, and if you, don't, if you just read it over fast, okay, you might say, well, he's talking about Peter. We're going to build a church upon Peter. A church can never be built upon a man. You don't build a church on a man. You build a church on the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the rock. He is Petra. He is a massive rock that, 
that we know that that's what we're to be building our church on. You build your church on a man, that, that church is going to crumble and it's not going to survive. It's going to have all kinds of issues and problems and, and turmoil. But when you build your church, you, when you build your family, you build your house upon the rock, you know that that can't fall. Even when the winds come, the rains descend, you know, all of that happens. We see that in Matthew chapter 7, when you're building your house upon a, a proper foundation, and the church is the same way. You gotta, we have to build our church on Christ, upon Petra, a massive rock. So, again, we see that throughout the Bible, this rock that we uh, are looking at, the conies would build their, their houses, their places of protection in that, the cleft of the rock. They would find a rocky area, and they knew that there was protection there. They weren't going to... Uh, their, their, their home, their family, their other little baby coonies weren't going to be destroyed because they built that home, they had that home properly protected. So the coonies represent protection. Here's the third one out of these four, locusts. Locusts. Write this down for the locusts. Participation. Participation. Locusts would represent participation. i got to go back to our text. And Proverbs, not Psalms, Proverbs 30, verse 27, The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. So now we see that they represent participation. These locusts would fly and descend upon anything green in huge swarms. You remember that was one of the plagues that uh, God brought upon Egypt when he was trying to get his people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt. So they would fly, they would go in swarms, and there would be masses of them, just millions and millions of them. But here's the key about this. They go forth in unity. Can we learn anything about locusts? How about unity? Unity. That's exactly what they represent. They represent participation. They work together to accomplish a set goal. That's what the locusts do. Their their goal in life (laughs) is to find anything green and eat it. A leaf, grass. I mean, locusts are known to go into an area where everything is green and just eliminate anything that's green. Completely eliminate that. But they they go together. It's, It's a... It's a unit of unity that they are working together. Listen to me. A church is to work that way. That's how a church works. So can we learn anything from the locusts? Yeah, I think we can learn a lot from the locusts. They go forth in unity. They're doing this together. Uh, They have a goal that they have set, and that's what they're doing. Now, our leader, we do have a king. He's Jesus Christ. That is our leader. We follow Him. We follow Him. I follow the Lord. You follow us, me, as we follow the Lord. If I get away from God's Word and I get out of God's will and God's way and and I'm not doing things right, you don't have a right to follow me. Did you hear me? You don't have a right to follow me if I'm not doing things biblically and spiritually and doing them right. I attempt... (laughs) The best that I can, I attempt to follow the Lord. I attempt to try to do exactly what He wants us to do as a church. That's the job of a pastor. He gets his orders from God, from the Lord Jesus Christ, and then uh, we pre- I present things to the church, and we have ideas, and we say, I, this is what would work. This is missionaries we ought to take on. It's because God is leading us to do that. But He doesn't just lead me. He leads all of us together. That's the unity of a church. What a blessing to have a church in unity. Uh, We have a blessed church here because we are unified together in so many areas. But we work together to accomplish a goal. What is that goal that we should have as a church? Our main goal is to follow the Lord. That is our main goal. Um, Our main goal here is to just be unified, have our hearts knit together, and just set our, our goals to do whatever God wants us to do. Look at Acts chapter 2. There's some great examples in the Bible of that. 
Acts 2 is probably one of the greatest that I know of. <clears throat> and so a church is to work together in unity. You know this is true. If you have, we have disunity in our church, we're going to do absolutely nothing for God. Very little for God, right? Uh, if we don't have unity, we're not going to... We're not going to go forward whatsoever. Unfortunately, there's some churches like that today right. where you got this group fighting with this group and half of this group is fighting amongst one another and this group wants to do one thing, this group says we're not doing that and you got this group, fight. it's like, <clears throat> and the churches are not going to survive with an attitude like that. We must be unified. This is a... This is a ministry that we are to work together. We work together. That's what we do. We work together. Um, this isn't even my, this is not my church. This isn't my ministry. This is the ministry that God has placed me over 34 years ago, and I plan on staying here as long until God says to leave or go or retire or die. <laughs> But I just, we need to be unified if we're going to have a, a successful church. We can't fight amongst one another. Acts 2, 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Isn't that amazing? I always was amazed at that. And one day, 3,000 people were saved. Another day, 5,000 people were saved. I mean, this church was growing like crazy. People are getting saved and baptized. It's amazing. <clears throat> and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Gladness and singleness of heart. That's unity. Did you see that? One accord. That's unity. They were all on the same page as we might say. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There was complete unity in that early church. Complete unity. There was no fighting. There was no bickering. There was no church splits. There was, no, there was nothing like that going on. There wasn't this person or persons or group wanting to, to do one thing and a, another group wanting and going against them and, and, and fighting against them and saying, no, we're not going to do this. There wasn't any of that in that early church. 100% unity in that church. They were all of one accord. They had a single heart. It's like everybody was on doing, had the same thought. Let's do this. And they'd all jump on board and say, yeah, that's a great, let's do that. That's the type of unity that was in that early church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Can we have that today? Absolutely, we can have that today. Problem today is the devil loves disunity. The devil hates it when a church is unified together. Hates it. And sometimes he will work on one person or two people or a this family or that family or this group or that group, and if he can get some disunity in there, he starts to win. That's why we always, always, always have to be on guard for anything that is not unifying. Always have to be that way. Can I say, I'll, let me say this too. Everything we do, not, not everybody's going to want maybe to do everything that we do as a church. There may be, you might say, I don't know if I like that, or I don't know if I agree with that, or I don't. Listen, if it isn't, if, if, as long as it's biblical, as long as we're trying to go forward for the Lord, can't we work together? 
Of course we can. We have a goal. We, we want to build a, a bigger building. We want to expand. We've got property. We, we need to expand that property. We need to utilize the property when we can, when God leads us to do that. I know the building programs can split a church. Oh, they can. Uh, I don't want the carpet that, I don't want the walls that, that's a stupid color. That's a dumb, that's not a good color of the chairs or the pews, whatever it is. I want pews. I want chairs. Well, this group here wants chairs and this group over here wants pews. And if you don't get pews, we're leaving the church. That's a stupid reason to leave a church. As long as you can sit on something padded, you ought to be happy. Amen. 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 As long as you have a pad back there, it, it, whether it's a pew or a chair, you ought to be thankful. You ought to be happy. I mean, many years ago, they didn't have padded pews. They didn't, you, you, you sat on a concrete block. And some, in some places today, in some of these other countries, you sit on a board. That's all you have is a board to sit on with two concrete blocks on both sides. Would you like that? We could get that in a new building. We could get some two-by-tens and just spread them out. Two-by-fours. <laughs> two <by> <laughs> We'd even make sure they're sanded. And, okay. But you know what I'm saying? As long as, there's, as long as it's comfortable, what does it matter if it's a pew or a chair? What does it matter if it's, if it's blue or gray or green or white or whatever? What does it matter if the walls are certain colors? What does it matter? But sometimes people will look at that and start arguing over that. Shame on us. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Drop down to verse 9. It says here, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he, he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Listen, <clears throat> the Bible says there in verse 9, we're laborers together. We work, a laborer works. We work together. We unify and work together. How can we get seven and a half acres mowed out there at the property unless we, some people are willing to help mow? Really? Think about that. I mean, Jim Fairbanks mowed the entire from the front the other day all the way back to the pole with the tire. I mean, he mowed it all. It took him hours to do that. He likes to do that. I figure if he likes to do that, go get him. <laughs> go do it, right? TJ last week, he, he mowed the entire back section, got it all mowed. It's all one level now. The whole thing has been mowed. It's all one level. Praise God. Now, after this rain, it's going to be growing really, really fast. So we're going to have to start mowing it again. I mean, it's, but listen, we've got, we've got people that have come to me and says, hey, I'll, if you need some mowing done out there, I'll do it. That's called working together. Laborers together with God. You said, that's a lot of work out there. I know it's a lot of work out there. But when you're on the mower or if you're, whatever it is that you're doing, if you say, I'm doing this for God, it, it makes it all worth it. Amen. I am beautifying this property for the Lord. A lot of people are commenting how well that looks out there. People out, out in the world, just people out in the community that I come across constantly. Said, Boy, you got that property? I saw that sign out there. I said, yeah. Boy, it really looks good. It's not, it's, it hasn't looked like this good in, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. I don't know. And so we're trying to be a good testimony in the community. It takes work, folks. Around here, it takes work um, to sustain a building and yard and, and everything around here. And so the locusts, they would work together for one particular goal. Oh, I'm, one more, a couple more verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians 6, 1. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. A great example of our unity was this past week for VBS. I don't know, I probably, we probably had about 30 teens and adults every single night, about maybe 25 to 30, I don't know, we, I didn't count them. Um, teens and adults working here throughout the week. Some were here every single night, way before 6.30 and stayed way, to, way after 8.30. You know what that was? That was, that was working together. That was unity. We put our little brains together and we put our bodies together and we were able to accomplish something that needed to be done. That's, that's what a church is all about. Having people getting involved in doing things. Even doing things that you don't like. Still getting involved in doing things. 2 Corinthians 6.1, 6, 1, it, 6, 1, it says, We then as workers together... With him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. We're workers together. We work together. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Philippians 2, 25. We talked about this guy last Sunday, Epaphroditus, a member of the church of Philippi. Paul says this about him in verse 25 of Philippians chapter 2. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Companion in labor. Epaphroditus was the guy that worked with the Apostle Paul and made the ministry that Paul had made it profitable, made it possible uh, that Paul could do the things that he needed to do because he had men, he had people around him that would help him. And so that's what it's all about, folks, is you and I working together as the locusts would go in swarms and as they would go out and they had one set goal in mind. That's what we need to do. There's no room in a church for fighting and bickering and you're, it's your way or you're out of here. It's your way or the highway. No, 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 no. Can we just work together? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collective thing that we do together. I don't always agree with some of the things that people come up with that they want to do. Sometimes we do them. Sometimes we don't do them. But we're still working together. We work together. All right. <clears throat> Last one. Paul and TJ's favorite little insect. Spiders. How many of you don't like spiders? Raise your hand. All right. If you don't like spiders, raise your hand. You don't like spiders. All right. Put your hands down. Any of you like spiders? You like them? Some of you are weird. I know. You like them? You could, you could take them or leave them? I was researching this a little bit, and I went online, and I Googled spiders. Paul, you would have loved that. Do you know there is a spider that's the size of a dinner plate? Can you imagine seeing that coming at you? Did you know there is, a, there is a species of spider that can run 10 miles an hour? 10 miles an hour. They got eight legs. Those, little, those big legs can move. There are some spiders that can fly or jump, I should say, jump 30 feet. You're not getting away from some of these spiders. I mean, can you imagine seeing a spider that big with eight legs just coming at you, running 10 miles an hour? Some of you can't run 10 miles an hour. It would get you. It would jump on your leg and it would crawl up you. <laughs> Does that make you feel good? Ah. And there's some little tiny spiders. They say that the spiders range from the size of a pea all the way up to a dinner plate. That's, that, is a, that is a huge... There's over 51,000 species of spiders. We only see a few of them around our homes and around the church. Um, we see primarily daddy long legs. They don't bother me at all. I see a daddy long leg. I can pick it up. And I mean, TJ and Paul, they, they scream like girls when they see a daddy long leg. Oh, pastor, come save me. There's a daddy long leg coming at me. And so... 
usually I have to come. TJ was always like that growing up. You know, he'd, he'd scream like a girl, and we'd have to go. <laughs> we'd have to go and rescue him from this little spider that was, you know, looking at him funny. He'd, he'd get all upset. And, and Paul's the same way. He sees a spider, and he runs away. But I'm that way with snakes. I don't like snakes. Now, snakes, he doesn't, you know, he, he tolerates them okay. Uh, he has taken care. He has taken out a couple snakes on my behalf. And I have taken out a few spiders on your behalf. We work to See, that's unity. We work together. <laughs> I'll kill your spiders. You kill my snakes. All right. Um, but again, I, I can't imagine that these, these spiders that big. Uh, they had some pictures of them online. And they, if you don't like spiders, you wouldn't want to look at those pictures. But here's what it says in Proverbs 30 and verse 28. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. So, how can, what can we learn from a spider? Do you ever watch a spider um, make its web? It's really an amazing thing. Do you ever see the web? We used to have a lot of spiders out in front here. They're gone now because we have this, we have a, uh, uh, this that guy come in every quarter and he sprays this entire building for spiders and bugs and all of that. So uh, the spiders that we used to see in the front, the mess that we used to see in the front, is not there anymore because they spray for that stuff. Those big, big spiders that used to come around, we'd see them in, in the hallway and stuff. We don't see them much anymore. Once in a while, one will sneak in. I think he's just coming to church. That's what I think he is. But he'll try to, he'll try to sneak in. But we take care of it, Paul. TJ. But uh, we have the place sprayed uh, every quarter, and uh, it seems to have taken care of the situation. Um, but here's what we see about a spider. Their hands are busy. Now, you say, but a, does a spider have hands? Well, I don't know. A spider has eight legs, right? That's what a spider has, four on each side. And they do a lot with those, with those legs, and I guess if the Bible says that they have hands, they have hands. Don't argue with God. God wrote that. Now, in their own essence, in their own little way, they've got hands because they do so much with those legs. They uh, make those uh, amazing webs, and they're constantly crawling around and doing all kinds of things. But <clears throat> the thing that we can learn from this um, is that we have hands, too. Out of all of the animals and humans, God gave us the ability to, to do some amazing things with these hands. Think about all the things that you can do with your hands, good things that you can do with your hands. I mean, you can work, you can, I mean, it's probably an endless list. I was going to make a list and I said, no, this is too long. I, don't, I can't make a, this is just amazing, all, all the things we can do with our hands. But you can just, you, we shake hands when we come to church with our hands, right? You can, if somebody is going through a tough time, you can sometimes just a touch on the shoulder or something, um, or you could put your arm around somebody and, and pray with them. There's, uh, in the Bible, um, Jesus touched people with his hands. He went up to a leper and healed a leper with his hands. I mean, he took some clay and some spittle, and he made this little a mixture of spittle and clay in his hand and put it on the eyes of a blind man and the blind man went and washed and was able to see. I believe that Jesus took his fingers and put them in the ears of a deaf man and his ear, he was able to hear. Uh, Jesus then, of course, had his hands pierced with the nails and those nails, those hands were pierced for you and I. In the New Testament, we see that when somebody is going to be ordained or uh, as the missionaries went out in chapter 13 of Acts, they laid their hands on the individuals to pray over them. You, we pray over people. When we have a special speaker come in, like Brother Hardman, we have him come down and us men, we get together and we lay our hands on him. and we're, It's just a formality of, of making sure the Holy Spirit is going to be upon that individual as we pray over them. It's a way that we can do that. There's, again, we work and we, we touch. It's one, of our, it's one of our senses. God has given us the ability to do, to do some amazing things with our hands. 
Uh, we have opposing thumbs that allows us to grip things. And we can, we can throw with our hands. We can catch with our hands. We can play ball with our hands. We can play instruments with our hands, as we saw this morning. Uh, if you didn't have any hands, Rich, how would you play the piano? Or with your nose. Maybe you could get pretty good with your nose and you, you could do that. Or your toes, yeah. But, I mean, with your hands, you can do so much. And he's amazing on that. I mean, the way that he plays those, those keys on that keyboard, he's using his hands. Do you use every finger and thumb when you're playing? Yes, sir. Every one of them? All ten of them? Yes, sir. Okay, good. And you're answering properly. Um, so we can do so much with our hands. We write with our hands. We type with our hands. We do all kinds of things with our hands. The spider, along with the ant, listen to me, the spider along with the ant has a very tiny brain. It's bitsy. You can't even see the brain in the head of a spider or the head of an ant. But these, these animals can do amazing things with that tiny little brain. You and I can do some amazing things, and we have a bigger brain. All of the tiny animals that we're looking at here today are not very nice to look at. Look at Some people, don't even, you don't even want to look at a picture of a spider, do you? Not really. You don't even like to look at a spider. Some people don't like ants, and they don't want to look at an ant. They see an ant, and you know, it's, it's a dead ant. You see a spider, you, you squash it, you do something with it. Um, they're not very good looking uh, to look at, but their work... And their exceeding wisdom tells us a lot. So there's two things about the spider we'll look at just quick and we'll be done. First of all, they work with their hands. Again, we're back to the subject of working. Working. We work with our hands. We do things with our hands around the church. We pass out gospel tracts with our hands. We pick up our Bibles and we lay them in our lap and we turn the pages with our hands. We preach and teach from our Bibles and we turn the pages with our hands, with our fingers. We can do some amazing things with our hands. And so the spider is with his or her hand there. The Bible says the spider taketh hold with her hands and is in the king's palaces. So the first thing we see is they work with their hands. Secondly, they're in the king's palaces. When you think about the king's palaces, again, I I think about doing something for our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we can do. We can work together with our hands in the house of God for the Lord. Whether it's playing an instrument, whether it's singing, whether it's working, whether it's doing something physical, whether it's doing something spiritual, we all work together for one cause, and that's the cause to please our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're in king's palaces. These little spiders, little or big, whatever they are, they're faithful and diligent in what they're doing. They persevere in a task. A spider, you can wipe out and destroy his web, and he is right back at it again, making that same kind of web because he's got to eat and he wants to catch a bug. You ever see the bug that ends up getting in the, stuck in that spider web? It's funny to watch. Well, it's not fun because you know the bug is going to have every juice sucked out of his body with the, from the spider. But the spider just sits on the outside or in the middle and waits for the the bug to get stuck in the sticky stuff. And then that little spider takes off and runs. Dinner! And away they go. But they're faithful. Again, you wipe out that web and they're right back doing it again. Do you ever take a look at an anthill? You go over to an anthill, kick it. You know what they do? They don't sit down and start complaining. Well, look at what you did to my anthill. What do they do? They go right back starting to work on the anthill and build it again. You can't stop these little creatures unless you kill them, I guess. You, they just they go right back working again. The spider goes right back and starts building his or her web again. You can't, you can't knock them down. Some Christians, you look at them funny and they're gone. You don't do what they want to do and that's it. They're, they're, they're mad at you. They're gone. They're arguing. 
We're in the king's palace here. We're in God's house. We need to be faithful and diligent. We need to be perseverant. We need to persevere in a task. Even against opposition and difficulty. We all face some of those things at times. Eventually, we will be successful if we stay at it, if we are faithful. God has given us some hands to work with. Quickly, Proverbs 31. Turn the page, Proverbs 31, verse 13. The Proverbs 31 woman does a lot of good things with her hands. In Proverbs 31, verse 13, it says, She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Isn't that something? She works willingly with her hands. Look at verse 16. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. Verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Verse 20, she stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Verse 31, give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. How well are you working with your hands for the Lord? The spider works with his hands, and we know that he taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. So the spider represents possession. Write that word down next to spiders, possession. She is there, or he is there. Uh, the Bible calls it and refers to it as a her. The spider is a her, uh, taketh hold with her hands. And so we see that with her hands, she has taken possession of something there in the king's palace. She takes possession of, her, of the things that she wants to do. So the spider's hands are busy in the king's house. How about your hands? Are they busy in the king's house? You take possession for what you do for the Lord? How about for the locusts? Are you participating as the locusts would? Are you going in bands? Are you going forth in unity? That's what the locusts would represent. How about the conies? Are you uh, in a protective area, sheltered properly in the rock in the Lord Jesus Christ? And, of course, with the ants, they know how to prepare, as we talked about this morning. Ants are, not, are a people, not strong, but they prepare their meat in the summer. Some of us, as we said this morning, are procrastinators. Some of us don't like the work. Some of us would rather just sit in our easy chair with our remote instead of getting involved and doing something for the Lord. Working in the ministry means working in the ministry. As I said this morning, I'll say it again, not to offend anybody, but God has no room for lazy people in the ministry. I have known lazy pastors that fail and falter, and they get out of the ministry fairly soon because they're just lazy people. We can learn a lot from these four little creatures. The ants, the conies, the locusts, and the spider. Hopefully you've learned a few things today yourself. I hope and pray that you're saved. I hope and pray that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you do not, you are in the right place at the right time. Please, when the music starts playing, come forward. We'll take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. Christian, maybe there's something the Lord spoke to you about today that you need to deal with. Father, thank you again for what we've learned from these four little creatures. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for uh, how you have created all of creation and what we can learn from it. Lord, bless and speak to our hearts right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.